My name is Stephen Rapp. Uh, I joined the, uh, the International Criminal Tribunal as the senior trial attorney in the Office of the Prosecutor in May of 2001, and uh, in, in May of 2005 became chief of prosecutions and left here in January of 2007 to, uh, to become chief prosecutor of the Special Court in Sierra Leone. When I arrived in May of 2001, I was put in charge of the media trial uh, that had then uh, begun seven months earlier and uh, involved uh, two individuals who were alleged to be effectively the directors of, of, of RTLM, Radio Television, Libre de Mil Colleen, uh, uh, Free Television and Radio of the Thousand Hills, but was called by many people Hate Radio, and was accused of having incited the genocide and been a force for actually command, control, and communication uh, to direct the killers to their victims and, and to incite people to join in the killing. Um, two director, two people who were believed to have been effectively the directors, Nahimana and Baraguiza, and then another individual that had been the, uh, the, the publisher and, and editor-in-chief of a newspaper that began publishing in 1990 and published right up to the beginning of the genocide uh, called Kangura, or Wake Up, uh, which was famous for publishing the Hutu Ten Commandments in 1990 that encouraged people basically to hate the Hutu and not to have a Hutu friend or, or concubine or wife or, or, or secretary or any Anybody in the military and have no pity on the Tutsi, um, and then uh, continued uh, throughout the 59 publications of, of that newspaper to uh, to basically incite hatred. Uh, these uh, three individuals were on trial. One was refusing to come to court. Uh, the case had begun uh, relatively well, but uh, the leader of the case had left, and uh, and I was put in charge. And uh, we had challenges of uh, we, we one didn't have the uh, all of the radio uh, broadcasts translated. Uh, it had been possible from 16 different sources to obtain cassette tapes made by others, not by the radio themselves, of, of, of about 273 hours of broadcast, but uh, only about 50 of them had been translated into English uh, or French and uh, only about 10 or 12 into both languages. So we had the challenge of proving that the radio did <laughs> what, it, what, it's, what was said and, and even more difficult we had the challenge of proving that these two men who had helped found it uh, and, and certainly were involved in its management before the genocide were responsible for its broadcast during the genocide. So it was a, it was a tough trial. Um, we, I'm with uh, and the advice of the, the junior people that were on the team uh, uh, put together a motion to substitute and add witnesses, which of course ran into a defense buzzsaw. Why do we get a new game plan seven months into the game? Uh, the, the trial chamber chaired by, by Judge Pile and with Judge Mosa, who both of whom were at one time or another president of the court, and a Sri Lankan judge, uh, Judge Gunawardana, uh, allowed us uh, about 17 of the 21 new witnesses we wanted. And I continued uh, to manage that case uh, through the end and, uh, and, and through the first convictions in the, in the history of the world for, for um, principles of the mass media for, for direct and public incitement to genocide. After that, I was involved in the process of uh, of one leading testimony of insider witnesses uh, in a variety of trials, uh, and two, uh, the process of developing completion for the tribunal. Uh, we at one time, when, when I arrived, it was anticipated we'd prosecute another 160 people, and it was necessary to knock that list down to 16, eventually to knock it down to eight, because the UN was directing us to, to finish our work and to transfer as many cases as we could to national systems. And so I was involved in the process of, of doing that trial. Uh, and then, uh, as a reflection of that, became the chief of prosecutions in charge of, of really all the teams. Not the, pro not the chief prosecutor, that was Hassan Jallo, but I was effectively the person in charge of the trial division of, of that office. The, what was at that time 12 senior trial attorneys uh, leading teams uh, uh, in, in various trials and investigations. What was the state of the ICTR when, when you started working? Well, there was, uh, there was then a, a project going on in the evidence unit trying to figure out what we had and, and how we got it. Uh, and, and it wasn't always that clear. We had uh, obtained an optical character recognition kind of search capacity to go over documents, many of which were in Kenyawanda, which we didn't speak, uh, to identify sites and, and, and names, et cetera, to, to discern what we had in terms of documents and what had been taken in, in earlier witness statements. But uh, a lot had been done very haphazard. By, by people involved on brief tours uh, several years beforehand. Uh, I came into the media trial, which was seven months in, 
uh, facing a profound <laughs> deficit uh, in terms of the evidence that we needed to prove these individuals' responsibility, uh, and even a deficit when it came to uh, proving what the radio had said uh, in, in its broadcasts, and really couldn't get the resources to do translations, uh, tried to do that uh, off-site, eventually got experts to translate excerpts, which of course the defense challenged, uh, though we said, your clients can read the rest. <laughs> If there's, a, if there's something in there that exonerates them, bring it on, you know, et cetera. So there were a, a lot of need for, for improvisation. Uh, quite often uh, there wouldn't be enough toner or paper to, to prepare the requisite copies of, of documents uh, uh, for, for the courtroom. Uh, uh, witnesses uh, uh, would sometimes uh, not, um, not show up at the place they were supposed to be. We suddenly think we're going to have a witness we didn't. Uh, we also had a dysfunctional, to some extent, kind of relationship between the attorneys and the prosecutor and the uh, who are prosecuting the cases and the investigators who are developing it uh, they were over in Kigali we were in Arusha and though there were lawyers over there they were supposed to be writing indictments and not involved directly in, in, in investigations and so quite often we had witnesses uh, who when they turned up and we talked to them, we discovered they really weren't uh, going to come up to proof, uh, couldn't recollect their statements, or maybe there'd been a mistranslation, or maybe they knew a lot more now, but if we presented their testimony, uh, people would accuse us of, of, of adding to it later. So, um, you know, it, uh, there was just no end of, of, of challenges uh, in, in this context. Uh, I mean, but there was a lot of people ready to pitch in and, 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 and make, it, make it work. What, what was the political state of affairs and the relationship with Rwanda when, when you started with the STR? Well, um, our team, um, and, and particularly some of my juniors, have developed a very good relationship with Rwandan investigators and with a Rwandan envoy that had been appointed here at one time, Martin Ngoga, who was, uh, who was eventually to become national prosecutor in, in Rwanda. And so uh, we were capable of reaching out to them and getting some assistance uh, sometimes when we, when, when we needed it. Um, that was quite important in 2002, uh, one of the more challenging times of the court, uh, and this has been discussed uh, on, by some of the former participants in it, like Prosecutor Del Ponte, who was my supervisor at the time. Uh, but there was always the issue of whether we would investigate the RPF alleged crimes and uh, people even like our chief prosecution expert, Allison DeForge of Human Rights Watch, who tragically died in a plane crash in February of 2009, so she's not with us anymore, but she testified 11 times in trials here. Extremely valuable testimony, but uh, in her book she alleges that the Rwandan Patriotic Front killed 30,000 Hutu civilians in eastern Rwanda in, in targeted uh, killings uh, between, uh, between May and then after July when the genocide ended on until September. And the question of whether we would investigate that was something that Carlo wanted, Carlo Del Ponte wanted to move forward on. She um, deployed a team to investigate, to, to interview witnesses outside Rwanda and neighboring countries and in Europe. Of course, the Rwandan government <laughs> quickly discovered what was going on. <laughs> Some of those people may have been connected to it. Uh, and, uh, and that led, uh, though they provided excuses for it, uh, uh, to a real slowdown in cooperation and in the flow of witnesses uh, to uh, uh, to Arusha, and in some trials, uh, sessions had to be adjourned. Uh, and understand this was was potentially crippling cases against uh, people that had murdered the brothers and sisters and mothers of the of the current government of Rwanda. But they were basically sending a signal uh, that they'd uh, rather have us fail to prosecute their killers uh, than to deal with this part of the investigation. Um, eventually, Carlos suspended the investigation, um, and uh, and then the witness flow began. Um, that's uh, with that particular episode, and I understand you can talk to others about uh, how that was eventually resolved by Prosecutor Jallo after I departed at the end of 2006, but uh, the relationship did improve, particularly in, in 2005 when we began as part of the completion strategy, uh, one, to transfer some of the investigative files where we hadn't, where we planning to indict, but we're now told not to indict additional cases. In, in three separate trips taken with Prosecutor Jallo, we, we brought over uh, a total of, I think, about 35 files uh, to, to Rwanda. And then we began to work on the process for transfer of, one, people that had already been charged but 
were awaiting trial in Arusha uh, to Kigali for trial under the under a rule that had been adopted allowing a transfer if the, if there would be a process that accorded with with, with due process and didn't uh, uh, and didn't have the death penalty. Um, we began the process, the, the, the negotiations to uh, ensure that those guarantees would be available in Rwanda, uh, which eventually led them to pass a transfer law, the creation of a special chamber of their of their of their high court for the for trials that would come from Arusha, and trials of senior actors that were sent from European countries, et cetera, back there. So, uh, and and we worked very closely in that. You know, during my tenure, we weren't able to get the judges to approve it, but eventually. Uh, a couple years later, that occurred. Two uh, accused in detention in, in Arusha were eventually transferred to Rwanda for trial. Six other cases of, of individuals that were indicted but not yet arrested uh, were transferred uh, to Rwanda under the understanding that those individuals, if they're arrested, will go to Kigali and not to Arusha. So uh, that really was a, was, a, was a game changer in terms of really direct cooperation because we were working on the same set of cases and, and facts. The politics uh, were incredibly complex in deciding who to pro mm -hmm. prosecute and who not to. But for you personally, was that, or professionally, was was that a difficult decision to make to know that if the RPF wasn't going to be prosecuted by your office, that there was not going to be probably prosecution at all? Or well. Um yeah, I do want to. I mean, there, there are obviously different questions in terms of, 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 of prosecution decisions. And uh, I've been a United States attorney, um, federal prosecutor in the United States. And uh, uh, primary responsibility for law enforcement in the United States is at the state and local level. And federal prosecutors take cases uh, that involve sort of, uh, you know, nationally significant criminal organizations, criminal activity that crosses state lines, uh, but but also can take uh, even local cases of violent crime. Uh, in in order to have an impact and can sometimes bring more resources to bear and sometimes even tougher penalties than, than the locals can. So um, I was very familiar with the question of choice uh, and making decisions and, and, and choosing cases for impact and recognizing that at the end of the day uh, not every guilty person will be, will be prosecuted. Uh, uh, you want to build strong cases, convict those individuals, uh, and the message you send by doing it to others uh, in other situations uh, is as important almost as the individual case. So the idea of selecting cases and the challenge that uh, that we had uh, with, with going from say 160 suspects that were uh, remaining that we could have prosecuted for genocide against the Tutsis of Rwanda, cutting that down to, to 16 and then to 8, it was something that I could live with. On the other hand, we were constantly looking at that file from the point of view of, well, this person could be prosecuted in this European country, or this was a, someone the Rwandans might be able to get, etc. Uh, so, you know, it is a tough uh, question sometimes and a fine line. And, and sometimes it depends on the ability to muster the proof, because not every crime can be proved, even the most egregious ones. You've got to have the, the witnesses and the, and the evidence. Uh, the, the RPF question is, uh, is a sensitive one, and I've had to deal, um, you know, extremely supportive of, of what, what Rwanda has done to, to, uh, uh, to rebuild itself after the, after the genocide, and extremely supportive of the efforts to prosecute those responsible for the genocide in their national courts, both their high court kind of more classic civil law uh, uh, trials, and the Kachacha trials, which I think have uh, largely been a positive thing to bring these trials together, bring these suspects and the perpetrators, uh, the perpetrators and, the, and, and the victims and survivors together on the hill. Uh, and um, though many times it results in relatively short sentences that the victims aren't happy with, at least there's a recognition of truth and there's opportunities uh, uh, to get uh, reparations that there aren't at the international level. So I, I, I favor that. On, on the other hand, you know, my own personal view was that uh, we had to vigorously uh, pursue cases that could involve crimes committed by the RPF, recognizing that our priority, the reason the court was called into, into existence by the United Nations, was the third great genocide of the 20th century, the murder of 800,000 people in 100 days, a rate of death faster than that of the, than the Nazi Holocaust, when the Nazi machine was, 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 was running full bore, a horrendous crime. I mean, 
we say like uh, you know three world trade centers a day you know, for a hundred days in, in a country uh, you know one 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 hundred the size of the United States and so it's a, a immense crime that we're dealing with and, and there will be always crimes in a conflict on on both sides and uh, and, and the highest priority was, was, was to the genocide. Uh, I think it was important, however, to investigate the other side and, and to find a way to, to try those, those, those cases, recognizing that in international justice, the issue of state cooperation and, and working that in a way that you could continue your other trials here led us often to the conclusion that we needed to um, complete our major genocide work before we dealt with, the, uh, with these other matters and, and in the end created a situation where when, when, we finally, when the court finally reached that point, it was, it was very difficult to do so. Um, by contrast, when I was the chief prosecutor in, in Sierra Leone, we did prosecute both sides, including the, the, the then effective defense minister of, of Sierra Leone for leading a pro-government group that had engaged in recruitment of child soldiers and mass killings of people in areas thought to be supportive of rebels. So, uh, in principle, I think it's important to do that, and uh, if, if you don't send a signal that these rules have to be uh, abate on both sides, violence gets worse on, on both sides, and one group's acts is used to justify even worse conduct by another. So, uh, um, and, but that remains a, a great challenge of international justice and an even more profound problem in national systems. Uh, trying people within governments uh, is, is never easy. Other than the, the media case, uh, when you look back, would, are there any defining moments or cases that really stand out to you as well I mean I uh, there are a great many cases uh, that, that I was in, in, engaged in I mean uh, I've often went into the military one case which involved uh, Colonel Bagasora uh, who was according to Allison DeForge and and, uh, and 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 people who've written on the Rwanda genocide really the strong man uh, throughout that that time period he, he wanted to, to after the plane crash to actually be in charge under a coup d'etat but but he effectively uh, um, engineered the death of all the moderates in the government and brought in extremists to replace them and uh, was largely in control of what occurred remained in Kigali when the government headed uh, headed west into refuge uh, so it um, uh, that trial and, uh, and, and the importance of, of laying out what occurred in the early days of, of, of the genocide and, and how this began, how the moderates were essentially uh, destroyed first and that enabled uh, them to proceed against the, against the, the, the Tutsis uh, was, was an extremely important case, a very um, heavy uh, amount of, of testimony. I do recall specifically my friend General Dallaire appearing uh, General Dallaire had actually come as a defense witness in the Akeesu case. Strange that he'd be called for that purpose, and uh, he gave some interesting testimony, but it, it, it hadn't been presented by the prosecution in a way that allowed him to tell his whole story. And, and um, if you know the story of General Dallaire, I read his book, uh, uh, that particular trip to uh, Arusha in 98, I think, was not good for him and, and led to it, even further complications with his post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, but uh, he came back here uh, to testify in, the, in a military case. Uh, I can remember exactly the date, it would have been in 2004, roughly, and uh, gave powerful uh, testimony. It was very tough on cross examination. And uh, one, one of the most dramatic moments in the trial occurred as, as he was describing his constant conversations with, with Colonel Bagasora, because as head of the UN peacekeeping mission, albeit with only 270 authorized force, uh, only that many men that could work for him and not the ability to stop the genocide and protect people in a few sites but without arms, just through their moral presence, uh, to organize exchanges sometimes of, of people from those sites uh, to places behind the lines, uh, he did save maybe 30,000 people. He, he would have saved hundreds of thousands had the world responded to his call. But as a result of his role, he constantly had to engage with uh, uh, with, with Colonel Bagasora, who had offices in the in the Diplomat Hotel, which is now um, I guess it's the Reina Hotel in, in, in Kigali. And um, he described how how tense these conversations were, and how angry Bagasora would would, would be with him. And uh, 
and uh, the, the person asking the questions on direct examination was able to ask him, well, do you remember the last time before today that you saw Colonel Bagasaur? And he said, yes, I remember it. And what were Colonel ba Bagasaur's last words to you? And he said, General, next time I see you, I will kill you. Well, the next time he saw him, he was sitting in the court charged with genocide and, and, and General, uh, General uh, Delaire was testifying against him and he would eventually be convicted of responsibility for the genocide and, and he's serving a prison sentence today. How, how do you think history will uh, look back on, on the ICTR? Was justice delivered for Rwanda? Justice was delivered for Rwanda. I understand in, in Rwanda they would have liked it to be closer. <laughs> the Rwandan government uh, uh, was on the Security Council in 1994. Uh, for most of the year that was the genocidal government. Uh, but after the victory of the RPF it was uh, the, the government, uh, uh, well at that point led by Vice President and Defense Minister Paul Kagame and, and led still by him as, as President. Uh, and uh, that, that government voted against the establishment of the ICTR by the Security Council. It was on the Council, it was a vote of 13 to 1 with Rwanda against and China abstaining. Uh, eventually we, 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 we developed a good relationship uh, uh, with, with Rwanda. But um, in terms of, of our ability to, to do the job and, and to accomplish justice, one has to keep in mind that uh, the major suspects of the genocide were not in Rwanda. And uh, they had uh, uh, gone all over Africa, in Europe, even in North America. Uh, w the court, because it had powers under Chapter 7, uh, where given to it by the Security Council. Chapter 7 says you know, that if the Security Council acts, every country needs to comply at, at peril of, 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 of sanctions or, or, or other enforcement measures. And so uh, it was possible, not just because of that legal obligation, but also with their tracking team and cooperation with law enforcement around the world, to bring people from 26 different countries here. And uh, those people would not, in, in, in that era, maybe more recently, it might be some might have been extradited to Rwanda, but with the death penalty, with questions about Victor's justice there, they would have escaped justice. And so it was possible to bring them here and, and, and try them in, in processes with, with international judges and prosecutors and defense attorneys, uh, eventually larger and larger Rwandan participation uh, in, in, in that process. And, and to establish the facts and, and hold those senior individuals uh, uh, to account. And uh, if this tribunal had not been there, that would not have occurred. There still would have been justice in Rwanda in their courts uh, of, of relatively low-level people. In the end, uh, the tribunal had the prime minister and 12 government ministers arrested, uh, at least 13 uh, military leaders, uh, seven or eight uh, governors, and uh, a score of, uh, of uh, other lower-level officials, and then, of course, media leaders, business leaders, uh, um, priests, other religious leaders, etc., that, that we were able to bring, them. and uh, were generally the highest level actors and, and the ones that have been able to get away because they had the resources to find a, a safe place in a more distant country. Um, anyway, we were, we were able to, to hold them to account here where otherwise uh, they would not have, uh, have, have faced consequences for their acts. After I was a, um, a prosecutor, uh, a, a prosecution attorney, senior trial attorney here and, and chief prosecutor in Sierra Leone. For six years I served uh, in the Obama administration as our chief diplomat for, for international justice uh, as our ambassador at large and, and that involved me traveling uh, you know essentially about 220 days a year to 87 different countries and, and dealing with uh, uh, incidents of mass atrocity in the past uh, and, and at the present uh, right up to what's happening in Syria today. Uh, and, and Re-engaging with the International Criminal Court, and but particularly with local actors, uh, trying to bring people to justice, and uh, and and the importance of of what happened here uh, in terms of convicting leaders for, for genocide, including a prime minister, uh, determining that, that, that sexual violence was uh, endemic during the, the the commission of that genocide, was actually a tool for the destruction of the Tutsi people, and and certainly also a crime against humanity in obtaining those first convictions.
Nations, you know, resonates uh, across the globe. And, and the fact that it was done here in, in Africa, close, but not as near as it could have been, maybe, to the scene of the crime, uh, and, and with a court that represented people from more than 100 different countries, I think, uh, gives it a, a kind of credibility and strength that even the International Criminal Court uh, has, has had, and, and obviously the International Criminal Court has you know, convicted two people so far, and this court convicted around 60, though we've got a big trial, big one <laughs> coming up for final appeal here, uh, and you know, certainly that'll be resolved by the time this is played, but, uh, but, but did succeed uh, uh, in, in, these, in these cases, and established uh, law, not just law, but also the expectation of, of justice after, after mass atrocities, and, uh, and, and for victims in Africa, uh, it was very important when this court was established in '94 because the previous year there had been a court established for Yugoslavia, where at that point maybe 60 or 70 thousand people had been killed. Eventually, more than 100 thousand would be killed, but here 800 thousand were killed. And so the message uh, uh, we were hearing is uh, these victims deserve justice too, and, and that continues to be an important message. And sometimes it's drowned out for perpetrators that say you're focusing too much on crimes in Africa. I never hear that from the from the victims, and I never heard it from the victims uh, uh, that, I, that, that uh, I met in Rwanda and elsewhere and that came here to, to testify in the trials in which I was involved. Oh, we're sorry you're doing this. Uh, we don't want justice against these perpetrators. Uh, it was extremely important to them, and it remains important to them, but uh, what, what happened here resonates uh, in, in places uh, around the world and, and will continue to do so.